Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to talk a bit about SUPA as a marker of immune activation and disease progression in HIV-infected patients. And uh, it's actually uh, a bit of a history about uh, what I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years. Because to take it from the beginning, HIV is a zoonotic infection originating from uh, HIV of the chimpanzee and Sudi mangabe. In essence, um, HIV pathogenesis is characterized by immune deficiency in the context of generalized immune hyperactivation and dysregulation. And there exists a vicious cycle between uh, HIV infection and replication and loss of CD4 cells and immune activation. And on this background, it's not that surprising that lots of markers of immune activation and inflammation are strong, predictive, or strong predictors of HIV disease progression and mortality. But what about SUPA and HIV? Um, we've seen this uh, paper a lot of times before, but uh, that was actually the paper that also kick-started me in this area, because uh, uh, when it was published, I was in, uh, in group with uh, Henrik Ullum, um, and we were collaborating also uh, with Jesper. Um, and, we, and, we, and this paper showing that uh, SUPA increased with HIV disease progression and that it predicted mortality as good as CD4 count, uh, kind of make us uh, ask a few questions, because uh, at that time point, it was also uh, published that uh, UPA, the ligand of uh, UPA, had ambitious effects of uh, HIV infection ex vivo, because one study uh, described that UPA, UPA actually enhanced HIV infectivity of target cells, whereas other studies uh, demonstrated that UPA had um, inhibited late steps of HIV replication, um, through interactions with UPA. So at that time point, it was actually a, a big issue or a big question whether the negative predictive value of high super levels in HIV infected patients were due to either uh, direct effects of UPA UPA uh, on HIV, so, so that uh, a high circulating super level might uh, compete with the interaction between the cell bound receptor and its ligand or whether um, the negative predictive value of SUPA uh, in HIV-infected patients merely reflected immune activation. So to, uh, to dig a bit deeper into that, uh, we wanted to measure uh, the different uh, SUPA forms in various disease stages um, of HIV-infected patients. And uh, we used some different assays. Um, we used a, an ELISA assay that was uh, developed and validated by the Finsen Laboratory. That assay did not differentiate between uh, super, uh, the full length receptor, domain 1, 2, and 3, uh, domain 2 and 3, or domain 1, 2, and 3, the full length receptor uh, linked to different uh, ligands. So I, I refer to, to um, measurements with this assay as bulk super because we're not really able to say specifically what is in this uh, sample. Is it the uh, UPA, uh, UPA complexes, or is it the fragmented receptor, or is it the full length receptor? But in addition to this assay, we also, uh, I also had access to a time result for resin immunoassay, also developed and validated by the Finsen Laboratory. And by this assay, um, we were able to measure uh, each of the different super uh, forms, that is the full length receptor, um, and by subtraction, we were also to measure this uh, domain, domain 2, 3, and we were also able to measure domain 1 alone. So by applying these uh, assays in uh, HIV-infected patients, um, first we were able to um, confirm the finding by Sidenius and colleagues, uh, demonstrating that uh, the ELISA measured super uh, increased in HIV-infected patients with clinical disease progression. We are also able to extend that finding to show that the super levels were higher in the patients as compared to the healthy individuals. And actually, this finding for the ELISA measured super, that is the bulk super, we are able to extend that finding to include the uh, full receptor to the receptor uh, uh, encompassing domain 2 and 3 and to the domain 1 fragment. All of the measured superforms increased with HIV disease progression, and they were all higher in HIV-infected patients as compared to healthy individuals.
When we looked at super and mortality, we were also able to confirm the finding by Sidenius and colleagues again that the bulk super measurement was a strong and independent predictor of mortality in HIV infected patients. But again, we were able to extend that finding also to include the uh, full length receptor and the truncated receptor uh, comprising domain two and three. Both of these were independent predictors of mortality in HIV infected patients. And especially the finding that this truncated receptor was an independent predictor of mortality emphasized for us that, that a kind of competition with the cell-bound receptor could not alone explain the negative predictive value of super in HIV-infected patients. And actually, the biologic activity of these two receptors uh, is expected to be very different if they have any, because, uh, because uh, this receptor binds various ligands, whereas this does not. So that was a, a very, very important finding. The truncated uh, domain one could not predict mortality when confronted with other um, various, various other markers that uh, could so. So that was just uh, an univariate marker of mortality. When we looked at uh, at the different uh, specific super forms and uh, looked at correlations of these forms to the uh, ELISA measurement, we've actually found some very interesting because in the in the healthy individuals and in the HIV-infected patients, for each identified uh, molecule of super, we actually find, uh, found a higher signal in the ELISA um, for each of the uh, super forms we investigated. And, and we guessed that that might be uh, that HIV-infected patients had higher uh, levels of UPA-UPA com complexes in the circulation, and that was actually later confirmed by Sidenius and colleagues. So uh, that was interesting. We also looked at the capacity of whole blood to release UPA when stimulated uh, in vitro for 24 hours, either with PHA and LPS or left unstimulated. And we found that uh, this is a busy slide, but I'll just go through it. But when we just measured the levels of uh, super uh, with the ELISA or with the specific assays after 24 hour stimulation with PHA and LPS, we found that HIV infected patients with the gray bars had lower levels uh, of super in their blood as compared to the healthy individuals. Quite opposite, we found that if the blood samples were left unstimulated for 24 hours, the patients actually had higher levels of super in their uh, whole blood cultures as compared to the healthy individuals. And of course, it should be taken into account that the patients, of course, they had higher baseline levels of uh, UPA or super in the blood. So we calculate the net stimulated release of UPA from these cultures by subtracting the spontaneous release from the stimulated release. And we found uh, quite convincingly that the patients had a quite reduced capacity to release UPA into these uh, supernatants uh, of the whole blood. And of course, the patients were also leukopenic, so uh, we calculated uh, the release of UPA on a per cell basis by dividing uh, the amount of SUPA uh, by the leukocyte count, but we also still found that the patients had a reduced capacity to release SUPA into the supernatant. And this finding is, is actually quite a quite common finding in, in progressed HIV-infected patients, that they have high circulating levels of inflammatory markers, but a low capacity to release these markers when uh, cells or immune cells are stimulated in vitro. So this was a pattern quite uh, often seen for various cytokines. 